Sexy One and iPlayer. The BBC News at 10 with Clive Myrie. Tonight at 10, the Kremlin says scores of Russian servicemen have been killed after a missile strike in eastern Ukraine. The attack was on a military base, but Ukrainian forces claim hundreds of Russian soldiers may have died. We'll have the very latest. Also on the programme, a dire warning over some A&E departments in the UK found to be in a complete state of crisis. There are calls for urgent government action to save lives. All this is uh, at a level that most of us who've worked in emergency medicine have never seen before. It's, it's dreadful and we've chosen our words carefully. It really is a crisis out there at the moment. Three people have died following a hotel fire in Perth. Prince Harry says the royal family has shown no willingness to reconcile with him or Meghan Markle. Good evening. In one of the deadliest attacks on Russian forces since their invasion of Ukraine, the Kremlin says 63 of its servicemen have been killed after a missile attack on a Russian base in the Donetsk region. It happened on New Year's Eve. However, the Ukrainian armed forces had earlier claimed as many as 400 Russians had died in the town of Makivka. Our correspondent Hugo Beshega has the very latest from the capital, Kiev. In a town in eastern Ukraine, rubble and many questions. This used to be a school, apparently turned into a base for Russian soldiers. At around midnight on New Year's Eve, Ukraine struck. How many were killed remains unclear. In Moscow, the army claimed the attack was carried out with rockets supplied by the Americans. But there was also a rare admission of casualties. As a result of the strike by four rockets with high explosive warheads against the temporary deployment point, 63 Russian servicemen were killed. In Russia, military bloggers were furious. They accused the army of failing to hide its troops and of housing them near ammunition stores. One report said the use of mobile phones by soldiers allowed the building to be located. And here, in Kyiv, there were more conflicting reports. First, the military claimed that 400 Russian troops had been killed. But now, it says the number is still being investigated. Eastern Ukraine has seen some of the fiercest battles in recent weeks. The latest Ukrainian attack could be one of the deadliest on Russian forces since the start of the war. Hugo, this is clearly a devastating attack. Just sum up the significance of this assault. Well, Clive, I think it's quite significant, first because of the extent of the losses. Moscow decided that it couldn't stay silent. It had to acknowledge this attack. But I think it's also significant because it could suggest a new strategy by the Ukrainians. Up until now, Ukraine has been using these long-range rockets supplied by the Americans to target Russia's military logistics and supply lines. But in recent weeks, they've been attacking bases and troop concentrations. Now, since the Ukrainians recaptured Kherson in mid-November, the front lines haven't really changed. The Ukrainians have been saying that they're waiting weather uh, conditions to improve, to resume their operations, to take back territory that's now under occupation. So I think these latest attacks could uh, give us a suggestion uh, of where this counteroffensive is likely to go next. OK, Hugo, thank you. Hugo Beshega, they're live in Kyiv. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine is warning that some A&E departments across the UK are in a complete state of crisis. Rising COVID cases and a severe flu outbreak have been blamed for putting more strain on services that are already stretched. A number of hospitals have now declared what are called critical incidents, meaning they can't function as normal due to extraordinary pressure. And the British Medical Association, which represents doctors, says pressure on the NHS is intolerable and unsustainable. Our health correspondent, Catherine Burns, has that story. Welcome to NHS Winter. Ambulances lined up outside hospital. Patients waiting in corridors. Now there are calls for the government to declare a national major incident. 
all these emergency calls. And then Sharon Chalice had to wait five and a half hours for an ambulance with her mum, who was gasping for breath. All the other ambulances for the whole area were being directed to Exeter, which is almost unheard of. And there were, I think there was 12 ambulances queuing out there. And, you know, it was just horrific. I just thought I, there was, the operator was telling me to go and get a defibrillator. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, this is my mum. Absolutely petrifying. But is this year different to normal? Well, A&E figures are worse than at any time since records started in 2004. One in 10 patients who need admitting is waiting over 12 hours for a bed. It's undeniable that the NHS is under extreme pressure. 18% more people have turned up to A&E departments in England in the last six weeks compared to the same time last year. Nine and a half thousand people are in hospital with COVID. That's more than doubled recently. Add on to that almost 4,000 with flu, another sharp increase. And this means that 13% of hospital beds are being used for COVID and flu patients. We know that for every 82 patients who wait for more than six hours in an emergency department, there's one associated death. Now, at the moment, uh, in many emergency departments, we're lucky if we even see a patient within six hours, let alone uh, get them admitted to hospital within that time. The Royal College of Emergency Medicine claims between three and 500 people a week are dying because of these delays. NHS England, though, insists there's no evidence for that. It says there are several complicated reasons why we're seeing higher death rates than usual coming out of a pandemic. We have got some people who are having to wait much longer than either we or they would want. And that is uncomfortable for everybody in the NHS, which is why NHS staff are working as hard as they possibly can. You've said you're deeply uncomfortable with the level of care that some patients are getting right now. But your job is NHS England's chief strategy officer. What is your strategy for fixing this? There is a very clear plan. Recover services, get back to delivering the long term plan and transform the NHS for the future. And all this comes when more strike action is planned by NHS workers this month. Catherine Burns, BBC News. Well, our political correspondent Ben Wright is at Westminster. Ben, yet more pressure on ministers to come up with some sort of solution to the current NHS crisis. Pressure that's cranking up by the day, Clive. Uh, this is not the first winter crisis that the NHS has faced, but it could be one of, one of the worst. And the massive demand we're seeing on hospitals right now is again exposing the fragility of healthcare systems across the UK, from staff shortages through to the pressure on hospital beds, which is one symptom of the ongoing crisis in social care. On top of that, we expect to see more strikes by ambulance workers and nurses, as Catherine said, later this month, and there's no sign of a resolution in those disputes. For patients, target after target is being missed, and for many, it is a miserable experience. So politically, the state of the NHS in England is now a real political problem for Rishi Sunak's government. Ministers say it is a number one priority for the Prime Minister and point to the fact that money's been pouring in recently. An extra £14 billion over two years was announced in the autumn, another £500 million to try and free up beds this winter. But the problem is record spending is not improving productivity in the health service. And Labour's argument is that what we're seeing now is the consequence of years of underinvestment and mismanagement. And they say that the Conservatives have run out of ideas. So as pressures grow in the NHS, so it does on Rishi Sunak's government, both to grip this current crisis, but also try and find a long term fix. OK, Ben, thank you. Ben right there at Westminster. Three people have died in a fire at a hotel in Perth. Eleven other people were injured but didn't need hospital treatment. Guests at the hotel in the centre of the city were evacuated before dawn. Our Scotland correspondent James Shaw has the full details. Around five this morning, flames burst from a window at the new county hotel. The fire is burning fiercely but appears to be confined to the second floor. Video captured by another eyewitness shows the scale of the emergency response. 21 ambulance crews and around 60 firefighters. Our firefighters worked extremely hard in a very complex and challenging environment to prevent the further spread of fire and damage where possible. 
After the blaze had been put out, firefighters discovered three bodies. A dog also died in the fire. No other guests in the hotel were seriously injured. From those that were evacuated, I can confirm that 11 people were given treatment by the Scottish Ambulance Service that did not require hospitalisation. The police have sealed off a large part of the centre of the city. That disruption is likely to continue for some time to come. January the 2nd is a public holiday in Scotland, but the tranquility of the day has been shattered by this tragic fire. The investigation into it is only just beginning. The names of those who died will not be revealed until they've been formally identified and loved ones have been told. James Shaw, BBC News, Perth. Two British nationals are among four people who've died after a mid-air collision involving two helicopters near SeaWorld on Australia's Gold Coast. Police say initial investigations suggest the crash happened as one helicopter was taking off and the other was landing. The Foreign Office says it's in contact with the Australian authorities and is supporting the families of the British victims. Now, throughout the day, thousands of people have been begun begun paying their respects to the former Pope, Benedict XVI. After his death at the weekend, his body is now lying in state in St. Peter's Basilica at the Vatican. The funeral is on Thursday. Our religion editor, Ali McBool, reports now from the Vatican. At dawn, the late Pope was moved from the monastery in the Vatican where he died for the short, solemn, private procession to St. Peter's Basilica. Santa Maria. There he was taken through the nave to be placed in front of the altar. Santa Maria Mater Dei. Outside, while this ceremony was taking place, thousands had formed a queue that snaked around St. Peter's Square. These were among the first allowed in through the doors to pay their respects. In just the first five hours, Vatican police say 40,000 people filed past Benedict XVI and they came from all over the Catholic world. It's just one of those once-in-a-lifetime moments where you, you kind of feel quite more, more and more emotional as you get closer to, to viewing um, you know, the Pope's body and, and realise the impact that he's had, I guess, um, on everybody. So there was a kind of a sombre mood as, as the walk uh, progressed. What was that moment like for you when you were paying respect? Uh, that moment I feel so honoured because Pope uh, Benedict uh, is a, was a servant of God. We honour him. Uh, we follow his example. Well, there has been much discussion in recent days about some of the failings of Benedict XVI, particularly when it came to adequately dealing with perpetrators of abuse. But for those who came here today, it was just about paying tribute to a man they considered a great theologian and someone who devoted their life to the church. Aline McBall, BBC News, at the Vatican. Prince Harry says the royal family has shown absolutely no willingness to reconcile with him and Meghan Markle. In a new TV interview, the Duke of Sussex also spoke of his strained relationship with King Charles and Prince William, saying he wanted to get his father back and have his brother back. Our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph, has that story. They are the first hints of what this book will offer. The trailers from ITV and CBS in America released ahead of the publication of Spare, point to a bitter family fallout. It never needed to be this way. The leaking and the planting. I want a family, not an institution. They feel as though it's better to keep us somehow as the villains. They've shown absolutely no willingness to reconcile. I would like to get my father back. I would like to have my brother back. Getting his father and his brother back won't be easy. The royal family presented a united front without Harry and Meghan this Christmas. But Harry has repeated his claims that the family is an institution that didn't support him, with a media set against him. These new interviews have both been done by experienced journalists, and there is a sense that they may be more challenging. One of the criticisms that you've received is that, well, OK, fine, you want to move to California, you want to step back from the institutional role. Why? Be so public. You say you tried to do this privately. And every single time I've tried to do it privately, there have been briefings and leakings and planting of stories against me and my wife. 
You know, the family motto is never complain, never explain, but it's just a motto. It's hard to see how these interviews will help a family reconciliation. Prince Harry has again voiced his anger, his sadness and his frustration. And Buckingham Palace has again made no comment. An assessment of just how damaging these new interviews will be can be made when they're broadcast next weekend. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. Let's take a look at some of the day's other top stories. And a legend of women's tennis, Martina Navratilova, has been diagnosed with both throat and breast cancer, but says her prognosis is good. The 18-time Grand Slam singles champion, who's 66, will start treatment in New York later this month. Two men have appeared before magistrates in Birmingham charged with the murder of the footballer Cody Fisher. He was stabbed in a nightclub on Boxing Day. Remy Gordon, who's 22, and 21-year-old Cami Carpenter were remanded in custody and will appear in court again on Wednesday. Rail passengers across the UK will face disruption to their journeys this week as further strikes take place. Members of the RMT union at Network Rail and 14 train operators will stage two 48-hour walkouts starting tomorrow. And on Friday, train drivers in the Aslev union will also strike on Thursday. The people of Brazil are bidding a final farewell to the footballer Pelé at a public wake. A national hero, he died last week at the age of 82. His coffin will remain at the stadium of his former club, Santos, until his burial tomorrow. Well, our South America correspondent, Katie Watson, is live there for us now. Katie, a final chance to say goodbye to a beloved son of the soil. Absolutely, Clive. I mean, people here were queuing from dawn. It's now just after 7 p.m. and they'll be queuing through the night. I've seen people crying. I've seen people clapping. I've even seen people getting down on the ground as if to worship Pele. It's an open casket and there is a Brazilian flag draped on one end. So people are coming through. It's a fast moving queue, but it's a long one. People have been queuing for hours and will do throughout the night. It's a moment of reflection, I think, for so many people here, both young and old. I've spoken to uh, families who want to bring their younger children here to show how important Pele was. Uh, I mean, people have come from all over Brazil as well. It just shows how important P uh, Pele is for so many people. They say, we don't have a monarchy, but we did have our king. And in fact, we still have our king. Edson is the person who died and Pele will endure. So we're now seeing people overnight queuing and then on, uh, on Tuesday, tomorrow, there will be the private burial, uh, but after going through Santos, the city of Santos, Santos um, on, a, on a funeral cortege. Okay, Katie, thank you. Katie Watson there in Santos in Brazil. Detectives in Northern Ireland are investigating alleged abuse and unlawful adoptions at institutions for unmarried mothers during the last century. So far, 80 people have made statements, some of which contain allegations that they were moved across the Irish border illegally. A correspondent, Chris Page, has been hearing some of their stories. I was born to be neglected, and that was by every authority figure that came into my life. The girls were something that had to be dealt with. They were a problem, and we were the embodiment of their sin. For decades, these institutions across Ireland were symbols of shame. Becoming pregnant outside marriage was regarded as a moral disgrace. Women and girls were often sent to do exhausting work in laundries. The legacy is generations of trauma. And I went to the wee school down behind it. Um, up here, the Craigan, St Mary's Chapel. I lived with the foster family about three streets away from there. Marie's experience in Londonderry in the 1960s shows how fostering was open to abuse. She says a woman went to a children's home and asked this. There's a girl there and her wee brother. Can I have them? Like we were buy one get one free items. She was getting paid to look after us, but we were doing all the housework and mentally she was torturing me. She would lock me in a coal shed and that. When Marie was 18, she became pregnant and was sent across the Irish border to an institution in Dublin. One moment stands out in her memory. When I was going to see my son after he was born and I was brought back into the home, the nuns telling me that I couldn't cuddle him or kiss him, that he wasn't mine anymore. Mark was one of the children born into the system. 
He was moved from Northern Ireland to the Republic of Ireland as a baby. He found out who his birth mother was after she died. Kathleen Maguire had been searching for Mark using the name she had given him. When Kathleen was come looking for a Paul Anthony Maguire, there was, he didn't exist. My name was now Mark McCollum. Uh, so these, this way the systems were set up to keep people apart. Nobody would actually say, we're going to stop you, we're going to prevent you, but they put up so many uh, barricades and brick walls almost to, to thwart you and to deter you, to make it as difficult, so you would just go, yeah, I'm going to give up. The devolved government in Belfast had commissioned an investigation, but a political crisis has put ministers out of power. One of the inquiry's designers is concerned by delays. I'm very disappointed at the slowness in the process. The actual taking of people from their birth mothers without any knowledge of where they were going. It is one of the greatest scandals of our time. Officials say there's been significant progress and an inquiry panel will be recruited this month. Survivors want answers and action from the church and state. You know, we need and the momentum, we need the willingness to push this forward. If it's not going to come from uh, Stormont, it has to come from Westminster. What would you like the outcome of this whole process to be? Accountability. That they put their hands up and they say, yes, this should never have happened. Mary Arbuckle there in that report from Chris Page. In the Premier League, Brentford have moved up to seventh in the table after a memorable 3-1 victory over Liverpool. Here's Patrick Geary. Time for a look at the weather now. Thomas Schaffernacker is here. Prospects for tomorrow? Mm, wet and windy. Steady with the brolly, though. It's going to be quite gusty, quite windy. In fact, the rest of the week is going to be a bit like that. Uh, so, yeah, dark clouds on the horizon. But actually, having said that... Across many parts of the country right now, it's actually clear. Touch of frost, the, uh, the weather front hasn't arrived yet. It's out in the Atlantic. Look at this undulating jet stream here. It's, it's these sort of, these troughs and peaks that spin up areas of low pressure and then they are shunted in our direction and draw in the mild air from the south, subtropical air in fact, from the, from the Azores. So this is what's happening through the early hours soon. The mild air in western and southern areas, further north and east, that frost in the highlands may be as low as minus five. And then early hours of Tuesday morning, that weather front arrives, some temporary snow in the mountains, but I think by 9 a.m. it's overcast across the mo most of the UK. The mild air will have arrived. It's not a coherent band of rain, so it's gonna be difficult to forecast between, you know, from hour to hour when it's going to be raining, but suffice to say, rain at times during the day. Uh, there might be even a bit of brightness to the east of the Pennines for a time. Uh, very gusty winds around coasts, uh, possibly 40, maybe 50 miles an hour, that sort of thing, and the same continues into uh, Tuesday evening and overnight into Wednesday. Now, Wednesday, we are in the wake of the low pressure. So the winds are actually going to be even stronger, I think, Wednesday morning uh, in excess of 50 miles an hour in some coastal areas. But there won't be as much cloud or rain around. In fact, some sunny spells, I think, expected uh, on Wednesday. And look at those values, 15 in London, 13 in Hull, 10 in Glasgow. We are in early January and we're getting mid-teens across the south. And the rest of the week into the weekend stays mild, double figure temperatures for sure in the south rainier days slightly drier days in the north also quite uh, mild around about to say average it about nine or ten degrees back to you thomas thank you thomas schaffernacker there that's it but the news continues here on bbc one as we join our colleagues across the nations and regions there they are standing by for all the news where you are have a very good night